It's been a busy week for free speech, or the lack of it. Last Friday, the Free Day Palestine Congress opened in Berlin. The conference was intended to be a venue where around 250 participants could discuss Israel's war on Gaza, with a particular focus on Germany's military support for the rogue state. Invited speakers included former Greek finance minister Yanis Varoufakis and British-Palestinian surgeon Ghassan Abu Sitta. But this was the moment that German police shut it down less than an hour after it started. Russia needs to get food. Mosques, churches, universities, cemeteries, bakeries, apartment buildings. The police are standing right in front of us and they ask us to stop the video. Everyone keep calm, please. Don't give them any reason to be violent. Um, Their explanations as to why have been somewhat vague. So explaining their action, the Berlin police said this. At the Palestine Congress, a speaker was connected who is banned from political activity. There is a risk that a speaker who has made anti-Semitical violence glorifying public statements in the past will be called in repeatedly. Therefore, the meeting was terminated and a ban was also imposed for Saturday and Sunday. And it's unclear who exactly they were concerned about, but the ban hit some high-profile people. Here's what Ghassan Abu Sitta experienced. So this morning at 10 o'clock, I landed in Berlin to attend a conference on Palestine where I had been asked, along with many um, others, in the UK, in the United States, and in Europe, to give my evidence of the 43 days that I had seen in the hospitals in Gaza, working in both Shifa and Al-Ahli Hospital. Upon um, arrival, I was stopped at the passport office. I was then escorted down to the basement of the airport, where I was questioned for around three and a half hours. Um, At the end of three and a half hours, I was told that I will not be allowed to enter German soil, that I will, and that this ban will last the whole of April. And not just that, that if I were to try to set, to link up by Zoom, uh, um, or FaceTime with the conference, even if I was outside Germany, or I were to send a video of my lecture, to the conference in Berlin, then um, that would constitute a breach of German law and that I would endanger myself uh, to having a fine or even up to a year of prison. I then was asked at the end to book a flight back to uh, the UK. Uh, My passport was taken away from me and then I only got my passport back as I was uh, boarding the plane. Yanis Varoufakis also found himself in Germany's bad books. Do you know that uh, the German Interior Ministry has just issued me with a ban? I've been banned from entering Germany. And indeed, if that were not enough, I've been banned from talking to you via Zoom, or indeed through a video message like this, uh, the threat being that if I dare do it, exactly what I'm doing now, that I will be tried in Germany for breaking German law. Why? Because of a speech that I published yesterday on my blog calling for universal human rights in Israel-Palestine, a speech that uh, we were banned, I was banned from delivering in the uh, Palestine Congress in Berlin, which the police, in its infinite wisdom, uh, entered the venue and violently disbanded. Speaking to Democracy Now!, Varoufakis gave this explanation for Germany's worrying reaction to the Congress. They do not want a Congress like ours, especially one that includes progressive Jews. That is the main thing that they detested, that they were Jewish demonstrators, Jewish activists, Jewish intellectuals, Jewish speakers with us, with one voice saying one thing, one thing alone, equal political rights civil liberties, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. I'm neither a Jew nor a Palestinian. I don't have a view. 
as to how this will be accomplished. But I think every single human person on this planet has an obligation, not a right, an obligation to demand from the river to the sea equal political rights. And the German political establishment does not want to listen to this. They simply want to associate anyone who opposes Netanyahu's government or any government in Israel that perpetrates genocide, essentially, to be associated, to be stigmatized as an anti-Semite, which, by the way, it is the anti-Semites greatest dream come true. The shutdown of the Congress is just the latest in Germany's clampdown on pro-Palestinian speech. German police have frequently used heavy-handed and violent tactics against peaceful pro-Palestinian protesters and various regional governments have banned or suppressed protests since October 7th, often labelling them anti-Semitic. In Berlin, using the phrase from the river to the sea is currently a crime. That's led to the arrest of activists, including for simply carrying signs. But it's not just Germany that shut down a conference in recent days. In Belgium this week, this happened. I'm not going to stay when the police storm the place and get everybody out. I'm not going to get involved in the fight. Uh, but they will be closing this down this afternoon. They have a closure order. The police have it already. That was Nigel Farage leaving the National Conservatism Conference in Brussels on Tuesday after the city's mayor ordered the police to shut it down, labelling it, quote, far right. Now, unlike in Germany, when the Palestine Congress got shuttered, reaction to the closing of a right-wing talking shop came thick and fast. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak called the action, quote, extremely disturbing. And Suella Braverman, who was due to speak at the conference, said this. It's a real shame that the thought police um, instructed by the mayor of Brussels has saw fit to try and undermine and uh, denigrate what is free speech and free debate. Um, I, I remember the words of Mrs. Thatcher, and I'm going to misquote her, but the more ridiculous and far-fetched and extremist their attempts are to silence us, the more cheered on I am, because it just shows that they've lost, they've lost the political argument. You could equally say that about Suella Braverman calling the pro-Palestine marches hate marches and trying to get them banned. Maybe that was because she'd lost that argument, right? Um, Hungary's right-wing president, Viktor Orban, was also due to speak at that conference. He said this, The Belgian police decided to shut down the National Conservative Conference in Brussels just two hours after it started. I guess they couldn't take free speech any longer. The last time they wanted to silence me with the police was when the communists set them on me in 1988. We didn't give up then and we will not give up this time either. And, well, there's crazy hashtags. Hashtag no migration. Hashtag no gender. Hashtag no war. Uh, uh, interesting uh, conflagration of uh, uh, negations there, I suppose. Um, both Brabberman and Auburn have been responsible for shutting down freedom of speech in their respective countries. In the UK, Brabberman oversaw bills that clamped down on legitimate protests. She was also incredibly aggressive um, when it came to the pro-Palestine demonstrations. And in Hungary, Orban has severely restricted press and media freedom. So we can assume none of these people really care about speech being free. Um, but someone who does is Yanis Varoufakis. In an interview for Unheard, he said... This, I'm no political friend of Nigel Farage, but I would hate it if anyone like Nigel was prevented from speaking merely because he may say things that may annoy, among other people, myself, unless we return to basic liberal values and stop wanting to be triggered by the arguments of our opponents. We stand no chance of navigating a decent course through the various landmines of authoritarianism. Um, the NatCon conference was up and running again today, so they've had a much easier ride than the pro Palestinians. Um, they were shut down for a day. The Palestine Congress you know, has been banned and people have been banned um, from doing anything political in Germany. Um, but we have heard more about the cancelling of the NatCon conference. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be consistent, though. I don't think either of them should have been shut down. Um, Tyg, what do you make of these two situations? I am like you in so far as I don't think anything should be shut down. The moment that you cancel something, I think, now within reason, like if the event is a direct threat to other human beings, I think all sensible people would agree that that's best to cancel. But the idea of cancelling something, I think, generally speaking, is not a good idea because it just makes the thing way more interesting. So I actually would agree with Yanis there in his assessment. Um, but I do think it's interesting that the right only ever has a problem with cancelling when they're getting cancelled. <laughs> like They've got no problem whatsoever with murky lefties like us getting cancelled left, right and centre. To be fair, I think we, I think you see a, a fair amount of um, 
opportunistic support for cancelling on on both sides, I would hazard to say. Although I do think, you know, it's clear from our political establishment that there has been much more noise about the the NatCon conference than there has been about the Palestine con- Congress. As I say, even though the Palestine Congress, its, re- its repression was much more um, severe. Um, McCarthyism about pro-Palestinian viewpoints isn't just finding expression in Germany. In the US, um, your position on Palestinian resistance can put your job at risk. Jody Dean is a leading American political theorist and is a tenured professor at Hobart and William Smith Colleges in New York State. The idea of tenure is to give you the freedom to say what you want without risking your job. The whole point of it is to protect academic free speech. But Dean has apparently found a limit to that. In an article for Verso last week titled Palestine Speaks for Everyone, Dean argued that the narrative around October the 7th has been designed to conceal the liberatory nature of Hamas's action. And in it, Dean writes this. Defending Hamas, we take the side of the Palestinian resistance responding to a revolutionary subject, the subject fighting against occupation and oppression, and recognizing this subject as an effect of a contested and open process. Which side are you on? Liberation or Zionism and imperialism? There are two sides and no alternative, no negotiation of the relation between oppressor and oppressed. Um, Now, you may not agree with that statement. Personally, I don't agree with Dean's article. Um, But Jody Dean's First Amendment rights guarantee her the freedom to say it. Never mind, though, because her employer found a way around them. And so Jody Dean has been suspended from teaching, after which the university said this. Hobart and William Smith Colleges deeply believe in and supports free speech and academic freedom. It is a tenet of our work. This means that Professor Dean has the right to express her views, just as others have the right to find those views reprehensible and to condemn them. However, Hobart and William Smith also has an obligation, as do all colleges and universities in the United States, under federal anti-discrimination laws, including Title VI, to take action when we know or should know of a hostile environment based on national origin. This is the law and we fully abide by it. Um, According to Jody Dean, the university has offered no explanation for how her essay has created a hostile environment. Um, Tyke, um, what do you think of this particular controversy? Well, I actually feel like her article is is pretty accurate, to be honest. I, I kind of like the idea of the oppressed and the oppressor. It's it feels like Israel right now is a laboratory for for to whether you want to believe that there is there is just two sides and you've got to take sides and that there is no space in the middle. So I feel like it's very it's increasingly difficult for somebody who would see themselves as on the left in Israel. Um, and like Gideon Levy and other people have pointed out that leftism in Israel doesn't ever consider the occupation. So you could be socially liberal, you could be, you know, pro-LGBTQ+, for instance, but the occupation is kind of the unmentionable. Um, And I feel like the thrust of of her argument is effectively that, that there's kind of no standing on the sidelines. You've got to take sides. And the resistance um, is, I think, an important And I think it's a beautiful thing and I might get into trouble for saying that, but like resistance, it's enshrined in international law and every oppressed group of people since the beginning of modern history has has had to resist in some form. And it can be obviously cultural, but it can be military as militarily um, resistance as well. Um, And it's enshrined in international law. And 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 that's that's the kind of that's the nature of it. I think people can be. You know, you can obviously condemn um, any armed group that commits atrocities. And I like I think most reasonable people would do that. But the idea of resistance itself um, is the fundamental right of oppressed peoples. So um, I I kind of feel that the article is reasonable. The means of kind of getting her cancelled just seem very familiar. Like I feel like you get it as well with big tech at the moment, just finding more and more ludicrous ways to to silence pro-Palestinian voices. And I think as the months are going on, it's getting to be more and more absurd um, the means in which people, the, the lengths to which people are going to just silence any criticism whatsoever. And to go back to our, our earlier point in censorship, if you're going out of your way, um, you know, logically and economically and other ways to actually censor opposing voices, I think that's a clear indication that those voices are saying things that are really startlingly true. Uh, I suppose my position in terms of international law, uh, uh, an occupied group does have the right to armed resistance. 
which absolutely the Palestinians have. But within that, you're not supposed to do stuff such as target civilians, which Hamas clearly also did um, on October the 7th. So, I mean, that's why I don't really endorse Jody Dean's piece. Of course, though, I don't think she should have been suspended from teaching. I was thinking about this because clearly, you know, the implication of the statement from the college is that because she said um, that she thinks it was an act of, of resistance that should be celebrated, um, what Hamas did, including the killing of Israeli civilians, then that would mean that, you know, Israelis, or I'm not sure if they would have included just Jews in general in her class, might have felt threatened or that they would be subject to discrimination. Now, I was wondering if they would have, you know, said the same thing about someone who was really gung-ho in favor of the Iraq war. You know, so if, if, you, if, if you'd had someone, you know, a, a lecturer who had said, the war on Iraq is absolutely um, necessary, even if it kills a bunch of civilians, um, this is important to protect America against terrorism, right? Was there any professor who said that? I'd imagine that's, I mean, that's probably a fairly common position for a neoconservative in the United States. Were there any professors who lost their teaching roles in case there was an Iraqi person in the, in the class? Now, I imagine not. I haven't done the research on this, but I imagine not. I haven't heard of, of any sort of um, pro-Western war uh, academic getting suspended from teaching because there might be someone um, in the classroom who is, you know, shares the identity of the people who were subject to that imperial war. So, I mean, maybe that's what she'll be arguing um, with the dean there. Um, before we move on, uh, Tyg, I did want to sort of take advantage of having you on the show to talk about the relationship between Ireland and Palestine. And I suppose the comparison being that we've seen in Germany, there's just, just this, this enormous um, censorship, but also, I mean, it does seem like it's, it's not purely top down. It does seem that there is a culture in Germany of support for for Israel. There's clearly a culture in Ireland uh, of support for Palestine. And I was wondering if you could, you know, talk about why you think that is. But also, and this is something I'm sort of interested in, what's the demand at the at the Palestine protests in Ireland? Because, you know, from a, from our perspective, we just see what 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 the Irish government says and compared to our government, it doesn't seem too bad. Um, so I was wondering mm. what 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 people are demanding of the Irish government in in Ireland. Yeah, that's yeah, it's a really interesting question. I think in the quick one on the German example, as well as for what it's worth, I get like so many messages from people in Germany at the start of the war. I had many messages from people within the occupied territories who are Palestinian saying, I really love your sketches, but I can't even like them because I'd be afraid of what would happen. And actually, increasingly, those messages are coming from people in Germany. It's mad from the US and Germany, mostly. And uh, yeah, like a German friends here, and I'm sure you're talking to people all the time to criticize Israel at all is just, um, it's just not the done thing at all. It feels like it's a country that's almost willing to sacrifice itself on the altar of war guilt. That's, that's really how it feels at the moment. But I think like the Irish example is just so different because we've obviously not got this war guilt. We've not got the Holocaust hanging in the background. And we look at things differently, I think, because, you know, we're oppressed, like, and without, you know, we're not looking for any attention or anyone to come in and save us at this point. Like, but we have, the colonial experience in our bones, in our DNA. I mean, people in the north of the country are still feeling the effects of British imperialism right up to today. So it's not something that's ancient. Um, and I think the Palestinian experience just rings so familiar to, to us. It chimes really familiarly. Um, the idea of dehumanizing the population so that you can brutalize them. I mean, that's completely, you know, British colonial playbook and um, being labeled as terrorists for, for resisting. And again, I just definitely would like to clarify, I'm not OK with the, the killing of innocent people at all. But the idea of resistance itself is a very familiar tool of oppressed people. And I think that's why the Irish and the, the Palestinians understand each other so well. So I think even in the south of Ireland, which is obviously quite different to the, the north, we don't have that immediate understanding of the, the colonial experience as much. But it's the Palestinian solidarity that's always been kind of there and nascent has developed into this really strong, beautiful thing. And it's now become symbiotic where it's it's reawakening Irish understanding of its own culture um, and history and, and all that stuff as well. So it's a beautiful to and fro between them. And to answer your question about the marches, so the, 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 the primary march chant is about an end to the ceasefire or is about a ceasefire, excuse me. Um, there are definitely chants about Palestinian statehood and from the river to the sea. And thank God we're not in Germany. We're not getting banned for any of that stuff. But I don't think it's more fervently like pro-resistance or anything like that. It's really just 
a human solidarity. It's it's quite apolitical, actually. Like I was saying to you earlier, you're seeing people at marches. I've never seen them on a political march in for a domestic issue in, our, in Ireland ever. I think it's just an understanding when we see oppressed people, war-torn people, particularly people undergoing a man-made mass starvation, it just does something to us in Ireland. It's so familiar in a horrible way and we feel this kinship. Um, so we're hitting the streets in record numbers. I mean, in my, I'm just from Cork in, in the south of Ireland, small enough, um, you know, all these little towns in Cork, there's marches and rall rallies every, pretty much every day of the week at this point. So it's, it feels like it's a real movement in, in Ireland. And I know the Palestinians who are here and who come here feel like the connection between the two countries is, is something that kind of means a lot to them. They feel kind of safe here. So I'm, I don't think I've ever been so proud to be Irish, to be honest.